Bible and turn open to John chapter 8. We are continuing our series called Redeem. As Bianca and I and our pastors are leading this church forward in 2022, we just prayed and said, God, what's kind of that word for our church this year? And that word redeem, the idea of God in his redeeming power, the redemption, that he takes things that were broken and he puts them in their place and they have purpose, takes people who are far from God, he redeems them, and then gives them a mission, and that's what he's doing with us this year, is he's going to use us to redeem people back to God, and bring them close, and set them free, and deliver them from all evil, so that they can have their true purpose fulfilled, and that's what he wants to do with each of us. We're in the book of John chapter 8, it's a familiar passage But many times we completely leave the context out of this entire thing. And we're going to study this. And I hope that you came ready to learn today because God's got something for us. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, one of Dr. King's favorite passages. So Jesus said to the Jews, okay, so here we go. He's talking to the Jews who had believed him. So these are people who had at some level faith, okay, so just, just we're going to come back to this, okay. Just remember, these people had believed him. He said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, when we're talking about truth here, it's important in 2022 to give you some context and definition because the way that the world right now says you live your truth, okay, not the kind of truth that's going to set you free, okay? You can live your truth and you can continue to stay pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, okay? You can continue to live your truth and you can continue to be in slavery to sin sin, okay? Not that. We're talking about the truth. We're talking about absolute truth. We're talking about truth that we can build our lives on. Jesus said in John or Matthew chapter 7 that if you build your life on my teachings, you're like a person who built your house on the rock. The storms came, the wind blew against that house, and it did not fall. We're giving you something that is rock solid, something that is true, and it will set you free. Now, the idea of redemption throughout the Bible always carries with it the idea of someone being set free and a price that's been paid in order for that freedom to be obtained. It's not just a general idea of freedom. It's a very specific idea. And in the context of Jesus' day, when he's saying the truth will set you free, he's referring to the truth that his payment of our sin is the only thing that's truly, really going to set us free. That's why he said this in Mark chapter 10. Jesus said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, as a payment. He came to give his life as a sacrifice in order to satisfy the righteous requirements of God's perfect law so that in us, By putting our faith in him, when we believe in him, when we believe that he is the truth, we put our faith in him and his sacrifice, his payment for us, the ransom. He didn't pay this ransom to the devil. He paid this ransom of his life to satisfy the justice of God. Sin had to be paid for with death, and he said, I will offer my life as a ransom payment in your place. The Greek word for ransom here is lutron, and it literally means the price of release for someone under the control of another. The, the price of relief for someone who's under the control of someone else. Specifically, in this context of this day and age, there were three primary ways that people use this word ransom. Number one was for a prisoner of war. 
A prisoner of war had to have some price paid in order to buy their freedom. Another context in this first century uh, Roman Empire ruled place is that slavery was rampant. And so someone could purchase their, their freedom with the, per, with the use of a lutron. A, a, a ransom payment could be paid to the slave owner and that slave could purchase their freedom and be set free and be able to live a free life. And the third and the final way was a Jewish law that we see in the Old Testament that if you are guilty of negligent homicide, okay, that someone's life was taken because of some kind of activity of your own doing, you could purchase your freedom from being held guilty under the law by offering this sacrifice, by giving a payment or a lutron in order to do it. So if you owned an animal like a bull and that bull went and gored someone to death, you were held liable for that person's life, but it wasn't something that was done with malice. You could purchase yourself. So that was how we're using this word here. And, and Jesus was offensive to some folks, and we about to get into it, okay? Because if you tell someone and the truth will set you free, you're saying that you're under the control of someone else. And I'm telling you, the way that you get somebody angry with you is that you begin to tell them that they're under the control of someone else. I am free. I don't know who you think you are busting up in here telling me that I'm a slave or that I need to have somebody pay for my ransom because, my goodness, I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. <laughs> Jesus is about to make some people angry. And we, we're going to pray and we're going to get into it. Let's, let's, let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. It's power, it's truth, and it's life. Father, I pray for the next few moments that you use every word that I speak to draw all of our attention towards you and the work that you want to do in our hearts. God, bless us right now under the hearing of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've entitled today's message, Redeemed by Truth. Redeemed by Truth. Um, I uh, recently uh, became the proud owner of a, uh, of a new vehicle to us, used to other people. And when you, when you have a used vehicle, you, you just discover all of the things that the previous owner just allowed to get broken. And then you have to slowly just repair little things here and there. And one of the things that they had done, I guess they had parked it for a really long period of time in the same place. And because of that, uh, like debris had gotten into the tire rim situation, and so we've got a slow air leak. I got one replaced. I know this because when the guy took it off, he was like, hey, there was a lot of debris that was in there, and it was preventing a nice tight seal to be there with the rim, and so we got a little slow leak. We fixed the front passenger tire, and now the rear passenger tire has to be filled up with air every few days, and that is inconvenient, you know, and so last Sunday after church, I had seen the little light on long enough that said tire pressure and stuff, so we stopped by on the way home from church, we stopped at the little gas station over here on Lily Cash on the west side there, and they had like an air pump thing, and you know, I'm out there, and it was freezing last Sunday, if you were here at church, you remember how icy and cold it was and stuff like that, so I'm filling it up, and my hands are freezing, and I'm shivering, and I'm like, come on, fill up with air, and you know how like when you stop like filling it up, and that little thing pops up, and it tells you like how much air is in the tire, right, it just wouldn't pump, it wouldn't pop, I thought maybe it was frozen, so I'm trying to dig in there with my fingernail, I'm trying to be like... Put some air in the tire. What's wrong here? You know, I'm freezing out here. My three minutes of air is about to expire, and I'm still not filled up. And what's going on? And, and after a good period of time of being out there and just not putting air in the tire, I realized it is deflating my tire right now. Like, it is, it is actually becoming very flat. Like, oh, my goodness, I don't know if I'm going to be able to drive to the next gas station to get air because I think I have completely drained every shred of air out of this tire. Needless to say, I was a little frustrated and I wanted to kick the tire, but I didn't because I needed to get to the next gas station. So I just got in the car and I let everybody know how frustrated I was. 
This is how the people were by the time Jesus gets to John chapter 8. They were completely deflated from everything that they thought that Jesus was about. Have you ever just thought you, you expected something to go a certain way and then you're like, not what I clearly expected. This is exactly how deflated the people were at Jesus by John chapter 8. It starts really in John chapter 5 that there's a man who was lame and Jesus healed him and then he had the audacity on the Sabbath to tell him to go pick up his mat and go home. The religious leaders got out of control angry. So angry that they start to plot to kill him. That's what happens when you mess with people who've got power over people. And then you start to mess with that. They will get very angry at that. You see that right now in the world right now. You see world governments that have an extreme amount of power over their citizens that they're doing some of the most ridiculous things. If you see some of the things that are happening in these other countries, you're like, wow, that's an oppressive government. Yeah. And think of how bad that is right now, but think of how bad it is when you add God to it that these religious leaders were taking the Old Testament law and they were using it to strong arm these people in the name of God. They were using God to oppress people and these oppressed people were just kind of submitting to it because it's just the way it had always been and so they were taking things like observing the Sabbath and getting mad when Jesus told the person that he had just healed to take up his mat and walk. And these religious leaders are starting to get angry. It continues in John chapter 6. Jesus feeds the 5,000. And then he starts to teach them that they're going to have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And the people are like, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. <laughs> Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, do you take offense at this? <laughs> See, Jesus just takes the offense that his teaching inherently has is in it, and then he just drives the knife even further and twists it so that it's never going to heal again, right? He's like, no, 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 you got to understand. It's the truth that needs to get in because the truth is the only thing that's going to set you free. And you're living in lies right now. And lies are going to keep you bound unless I cut you open and expose it for what it is. He drops on two verses later, three verses later. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, the close guys right here, do you want to go as well? Why don't you join them? How about all of y'all leave? Just go ahead and hold on to your lives. Just keep living. Just keep going your own way. Do you want to leave also? Jesus is not playing when it comes to truth. John chapter 7, man, he starts doing it again. He starts talking about all of the things like God sent me and you needed me to come from God and stuff. And people are like, Pfft. John chapter 8, he, he, he stops people from stoning this woman who was caught in adultery. And then he drops down and writes something in the dirt. Everyone who has, the, who has no sin can cast the first stone. Everybody's like dipping out till nobody was left to accuse. People were super angry at Jesus. So John chapter 8, when we're reading here, when he says the truth will set you free, people at this point were completely angry. Here's what Jesus said about himself, John chapter 7, verse 7. It says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. He's saying people are angry because I'm telling the truth. And people are getting bent out of shape. And we show up in John chapter 8, and here's what Jesus says right here. So Jesus said to the Jews... Okay, it's important that you understand this whole context of this. To the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. 
how is it that you say you will become free? You can see, they're already like, you know, like, come at me, bro. I'm coming right back at you, and I'm going to declare that I'm staying right here. I am immovable. You are not going to get me to repent of nothing because I ain't got nothing to repent for. Now, notice the whole passage, Jesus is talking about the truth, and he's talking about his word, okay? I want you to see how many times Jesus says this, okay? Very, very important. How will you, we will become free. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So here he just goes right in there and he says, you are slaves to sin. Because he's telling us the truth. I know he's talking to the Jews who had believed in him, but he's talking to us who have believed in him also. And he is going to show us very clearly that we have allegiances to things in this world that are actually holding us captive rather than setting us free. We think we're free to choose what we want to do, but really we're just following our sinful desires that lead us to do what we don't want to do. And that's where we're going to be stuck until we trust Jesus because there's this real thing and it's called slavery to sin that we obey sinful desires we go and steer our lives based on how good that thing right there makes me feel and I want more of that and what we don't realize is that we are being led astray we are following our flesh and it is keeping us bound up and here's what it looks like. Freedom? I was thinking about this. I was like, that is clever right there. I'm going to get you in debt, and I'm going to say you're free. Wow. How funny is that? How many times have you seen a freedom commercial come on TV, and you didn't even really think about it? You're like, look at them. Lying straight up, you're going to write freedom on there, and we're going to get you caught up in debt. Now, if you have a freedom card, just know it is not producing freedom. In your, I know it feels like freedom, especially when we got this tap thing, right? Boy, that tap thing, man, that's next level, dude. You know, for a little while there, you, they had you just sticking that thing in there, and you had to wait forever, and then we get angry at you. Do not remove, do not remove, do not remove. You're like, bro, I'm chilling. I promise I'm not doing anything. You ever taken that out early, and you're like, oh, I thought it changed, and I thought, do it again. And now they just got you tapping your way to freedom. Boy, you just tapping that thing. Be like, I'm a, What? Who purchased all this at the end of the month right here? Who bought all that? <laughs> Freedom. That's what sin does. Listen to what Romans chapter 7 says. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. I am bought completely owned, slave to sin. I am owned by it. Sin promises freedom. It says you get to choose. You get to live your life the way you want. You get to spend your time how you want to. All of a sudden, it just got you, got you all locked up, got you all just where you're caught all up and you think that you're free, but you're not free. You're not free. If you can't do the things that you want to do to bless other people, you are not set free. You are a slave to sin. And we need to be redeemed. We need to be set free. And someone has to pay the price. And Jesus is the one who paid for us. See, sin, sin enslaves us in two ways. First of all, it produces these compelling desires inside of me. And I obey it. I go with it. I say, ooh, that, that is a lovely way to make me feel. And I'm going to go, I'm going to have that compelling desire. The second way is that it enslaves us by ultimately condemning us forever. 
condemns us forever. Sin, when you are born with a sin nature and you go with it and you never give your life to Jesus and you never repent, you're never born again, sin will take you to hell forever in real time. It is real. It might not feel real because life seems long sometimes and it looks like I got a long road ahead of me and yeah, I can deal with that sin thing someday, but you're going to follow your desires, follow your desires, follow your desires, follow your desires, and you're never going to repent. If you don't do it today, you're never going to do it. There's never going to come a time where it's convenient to finally give up this sin practice. It is never going to happen. It's now. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear the word of the Lord today, repent and believe that Jesus is Lord. But if sin enslaves us two ways, I'm telling you, Jesus gives freedom in two ways. Number one, Jesus liberates us from the control of sin. He, he gets us out of being under the power of sin and following our sinful desires. He gives us a way of escape. The second way that Jesus sets us free is that he frees us from the condemnation of sin. He is condemned in our place, and therefore we have been set free. He takes the punishment of sin, and he gives us the freedom that we can live forever with him and rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years with him. The scripture says that we will judge angels someday. I'm telling you, there is a life and a life more abundantly that you and I have been so desensitized to. We've been so lied to by the things of this world following our sinful desires that we think this is all there is. Folks, there is a whole lot more that we get to do for him when we give our lives completely and totally over to him and he sets us free from the power of sin. And he says in John chapter 6, or John chapter 8, verse 36, for if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free indeed. Oh my goodness, the freedom that he calls us into is so wonderful. We keep that freedom away and we embrace this lesser fake, counterfeit version of freedom that we think, well, I can do whatever I want to do. And so many of us were in this process of being sanctified. That's, that's the theological word for the process of being saved. Yes, I am saved and when I come to the cross and I repent of my sin, but I'm being saved as well. There's this washing that takes place in my life as I give more and more of my heart over to Jesus and less and less of the world's control. I'm being saved. I'm being sanctified. I'm becoming more and more like Jesus as I walk toward him. But so many of us have put the pause on the sanctification process because at some point it just became too difficult to keep repenting of sin, to keep on giving more and more life to Jesus. And at some point I just said, I want it. I'm tired of forgiving people. I'm tired. I don't think they deserve it and I don't give it back to me, God. I want my life back. I'm tired of being generous. I'm tired of always giving up work, so give it back to me. I am so tired of spending time in prayer. I want that time. Give it to me. And we just stop. God just waits. And we just stay here, not growing spiritually anymore, not progressing forward, because I'm just keeping it for me. And Jesus says the truth will make you free indeed. And we're like, how about just kind of, kind of free? You know, just the generic version of freedom. Can I just have that? I don't need the name brand. I don't need Jesus. All I need is just kind of like saved, kind of. <laughs> like barely escaping the flames version. Can I have like Christianity light, please? And my call to you today and the call that Jesus has put on us today is to go all in all the time, never holding back, giving God all of my life. Because that's the only way to stay free indeed. 
Because as soon as I start taking it back and saying no, that's immediately when it stops. Freedom stops. The flow of freedom stops in my life. And God just says, I'll be right here. here here's what some of us do. If, 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 if your life is a house, we like to keep Jesus like in the foyer, right? Like just the entryway. Like Jesus like, you want me to take my shoes off? And you're like, you can just stand right there actually. Just stand right here. I'm just going to go and live I'm just going to kind of keep you right here because it feels good. Like, it's not doing anything anymore. You're not working in my life actively. You're just occupying a little bit of space to make my conscience just kind of satisfied. But I kind of know that there's more, but I kind of don't want to hear it. And then Jesus takes this word and he says, you can be free indeed. And it just cuts right through all the garbage. And we realize I have put God on hold. Like he's got all of the elevator music that's playing on hold. And just right there, I'm just going to kind of permanently just put you in that spot. And so just if you haven't been offended enough. We're going to read the rest of the passage here, okay? <laughs> Jesus said, ver next verse, okay, free indeed. Okay, next verse. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father. You do what you have heard from your father. And they answered him, Abraham is our father. Remember, he's talking to the Jews who had believed in him, okay? Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if Abraham's, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. Oh, Jesus just threw down the gauntlet, dude. He just said that. And your will is to do your father's desires. Boom. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. So to the Jews who had believed him, John 8, 31. By the time we get to John 8, 45, <laughs> they have been thoroughly offended to the point where now they do not believe at all. This is very important for us to understand because as we come to a text like this, it's important for us to just stare directly at what it says and not try to put our own lens on it. You understand what the temptation of the devil, the father of lies is, he wants you to get to look at the word through the lens of the world. We're supposed to look at the world through the lens of the word and to say, hey, this is the reality. The truth is that I am tempted by my own sin nature to follow sinful desires and Jesus stands directly in the way and says, you shall not pass. And we have to make a decision. Are we going to be like, hey, move out of the way, bro. I was kind of like trying to like go do my thing. Or are we going to say, you are Lord. You are Lord and I will obey you. That's why he says we, we have to have, we have, to have the, the word. He says you cannot bear to hear my word. He's talking to us. Yes, he's talking to the Jews who had believed in him. But he's talking to us. He says you can't, even, you can't even bear to hear what I'm saying to you. He says because you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? He's saying, hey, tell me, tell me how I'm sinning here. If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is, if, uh, is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? 
Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that, I do not know him. I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham saw it through faith. He saw it through faith. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and, have, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Whew. I mean, dude, that'll make you shiver right there. I mean, that was like one of those things like when, when like, uh, uh, Neo's like, like overcoming the Matrix and he makes all the bullets stop and he's like, boom, you know, and like the whole Matrix just kind of like flexes at his flex moment, you know. Like that's it, right? Jesus is straight flexing right here. He's kicking it all the way back to the Old Testament where God shows up in a burning bush to Moses and he says, I am that I am. Tell him I am sent you. He's like, I am. Wow. That is good stuff right there. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. You can't touch me. Get off me. See, what we have to do with a text like this is we've got to come face to face with what God's word really is saying to us. What's God's word telling us? That we have to abide in his word. We have to remain in his word. What does it mean to abide, to remain? It means that I find my whole being inside these words that Jesus speaks to me. And I live them in my life as though they are a reality when right now it's just by faith that I'm doing it. You understand, it's just by faith. Like, I'm just standing here talking to you just by faith. I'm reading what Jesus said here, and I'm just by faith telling you this is what the Almighty God says. Have I seen it? No. Do I see it through faith? Yes. And what you and I have to do is we have to take these words of Jesus and we have to consume them to where they become the reality that we live from. And when people look at our lives, the scripture says that people should look at us like aliens and strangers in this world. Not UFO aliens, like people who are from another country. That we have our citizenship in heaven. That we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. And we grab a hold of that and then we take it into our lives and we live it out. How do we live it out? By giving our everything, taking up our cross daily and following Jesus and doing it the way that he told us to do it, not the way that it comes easy and natural for us. On Monday night, the Georgia Bulldogs became the national champions. Thank you very much. I had nothing to do with it, although I was cheering for them and I believe in some way my energy helped them to push through. No, it didn't. It didn't. Because it hasn't worked in the past, okay? But it was to Alabama, too. Oh, it was so good. I went to the University of Georgia, and uh, in 1980 was our last national championship. So in the South, college football is big. After the game was over, on the field, celebrations were happening, and one of the defensive players from Georgia was, was caught in a little awkward situation here. Uh, N'Kobe Dean was wearing an Alabama national champion's hat. Somebody had just given him the wrong hat. He just put it on. He's wearing it around like that's the Alabama logo, okay? That is not the Georgia Bulldogs logo. Here's, here he is at the press conference later, and he has the right hat on. And they asked him about it, and he was really embarrassed because he, he, was, he was over here cheering for the other team. The other team won. 
I bring this because this is such a powerful illustration of what so many Christians live their lives like. I'm wearing the hat of the other team. I'm wearing the sin hat. I'm flaunting it. I'm following my own sinful desires. I'm just going my own way. Yet, I'm pretending I'm on the right team. And Jesus says, you have no place in me unless my words have a place in you. My words have to have a place in you. My word has to have its home in you. Are you living your life in such a way that at any given moment you could just get taken out of this life? Paul said it like this. He said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Like, I'm so unattached to this world. Like, I've got nothing holding me back. So many of us, we're so intertwined with the world. It's just in us. And we love the world. We love our lives. We love the stuff that we have. We can't wait to get out of here today because we're just going to go and do our stuff. We're going to live our lives our way. And a little sprinkling, just a little, little bit, little bit of Jesus. Just a little Christian, okay. But Jesus says, I want the whole thing. I want your whole life. I want to rule in your life. I want to be your king. I want to rule. I don't want to just be a little accessory that you wear when it's convenient. I want to have all of you. How many times am I going to forgive Jesus? Seventy times seven. It's endless. There is no stopping the gospel. It just wants to consume your whole life. Jesus wants to have rule over you, dominion over you, to the point that you are free indeed. There's nothing that's holding you back anymore. That's how he wants. He wants all of us. He wants to rule. He wants wants to have kingdom rule over all of our lives, over it all. I've got nothing left. Listen, Jesus had nothing physical in this life. He owned nothing People were like, hey, Jesus, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. He said, son of man has no place to lay his head. It's like, I don't, I don't even have a bed. Like, I don't own anything. They were like, hey, you got to pay a temple tax and stuff like that. He's like, Peter, go grab that fish. There's some money in the fish's mouth. Just go pay it. People were like, here's a coin. You know, what, what should we? He said, Who's, whose picture is on that? Yeah, that's Caesar's. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give God what belongs to him. Listen, God put his image on you. So you belong to him. Your greatest and highest purpose is to live for him and for his glory and not become so attached and in love with this world and your life that you'd be sad if Jesus were to come. You know, there's one guy, he came to Jesus, he said, Jesus, you know, like, like, what do I have to do? I, I've kept the commandments since I was a little kid. I, I've done it all. He said, go and sell everything you own and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And it says that the man left sad because he was very wealthy. I'm not saying don't own stuff and be wealthy and be generous. I'm saying go make lots of money and do whatever you want to do with it. Honor God with it first. But biggest thing is don't let money have you. It's, it's, it's okay to have money, but don't let money have you. So many people are owned by this world's ways of doing things, and they're so unsatisfied. When you come to Christ, and Christ is all that you need, you're so satisfied. It's just so, he's mine, and I'm his, and I need nothing else. Let's pray right now. Seeking the Lord. Make it a commitment. Build an altar where you're at right now. Lay yourself on it. Become a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. God, all of us, God, we give all of us, holding nothing back. Jesus, you make us free and free indeed. Jesus, I pray right now that you would offend our flesh, offend every part of us that is not lined up with you so that we can repent and be glad. We can repent and be happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will see God. Oh, God, we thank you that you have blessed us, Lord, with a spiritual poverty as we obey you and your word. Maybe you're here today, and you're not right with God. You need to be born again. You can be born again right now. God can give you a new nature. 
where you want to seek God, where you desire the things of God, where you desire holiness. And it's as simple as just saying, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and that you died in place of my sin so that I can be free indeed. If that's you today and you want to pray that prayer, I want you on the count of three to just throw your hand up in the air and you can put it right back down. On the count of three, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be born again. I want to have a fresh start. I want to have my sins washed away. I want guilt removed from my life so I can be free indeed. If that's you today, on the count of three, just put your hand up in the air and you put it right back down. One, two, three. All across this room. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, everybody. I want everybody to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Let's encourage those who may be praying this for the very first time. If you're watching online, you can pray right now, right where you're at. Say it just like this. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. That you died for my sin so that I could be born again and I could have a new life. Jesus, make me new. Wash away my past and give me a new start. I'll follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.